Dr. Bernard is up next, and she's going to basically present um, a patient that I think almost all of the residents are familiar with, um, and Dr. Patel as well. Um, and so it's, uh, we'll have a nice discussion at the end as well. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so, and I actually, I'm actually going to talk about two different cases. Um, I, uh, these two are, are somewhat related. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit between them, uh, just so I don't give away the diagnosis. Um, like I said, I'll do a review of the literature and discussion at the end. So, our first young woman um, presented back in 2011. Uh, she was 21 years old at the time, and she was hit by a, a box that fell and hit her face um, while she was at work. She had some associated pain and redness, um, and she had some loud blurred vision out of the left eye. Uh, her only past medical history was a previous wrist is, uh, injury that required multiple surgeries. Um, her past ocular history, she did have strabismus surgery as a child, um, and she'd been on some antibiotics and occasional pain meds for the prior surgeries, but other than that was not on any medications. Her visual acuity on presentation was 20-20 in the right, 20-30 in the left. Um, her pupils were normal, no AP. Her extracurricular movements and visual fields were full. Um, her left upper lid had a little bit of um, erythema, um, and her conjunctiva on the left side showed an area supertemporally where there was um, a distinct area of injection. But the remaining um, portion of her ophthalmic exam was unremarkable. So at the time, this was thought to be just due to the, the, the injury and that it was mild, and the conservative measures would really take care of it, lubrication. I just told her to follow up as needed. Well, just about a week later, the patient called in um, so that she was having worsening left pain, left eye pain, that it was deep and achy, that she really wanted to see the cornea service, um, and that she was having more drainage from the eye. So on exam that day, she uh, that area that was super temporally was a lot more injected. Um, there was a nodular area, and it did not blanch with dental afrin. So I thought at this time this was, was scleritis. So that she was started on ibuprofen 603 times a day. Um, and she had this workup done, which all came back negative. So at her follow-up visit, uh, she said that it was about four weeks later, she said that her pain and redness decreased for about a week, um, but then the pain returned and was way worse than it was before. And she said that she was having a lot of yellow and green discharge. Her conjunctiva at this time showed three plus injection, it was a little bit more global, and she did have some equal purulent discharge. So the differential at this time was, well, maybe this isn't a scleritis, maybe this isn't scleritis, maybe it's infection, maybe it's GPA or some other inflammatory entity. Um, so a few additional labs were added, a cult, uh, just a culture, um, a quantitative gold, an Inca, um, and she was started on topical antibiotics, and she was looking more infectious at this time. So then again, she came back, pain is worse, she says drainage is worse, it's more red, um, this nodule is now larger, it really does appear infected. So she's, the big guns are brought out, she's sort of on oral antibiotics and topical steroids. Um, and at this time, so there was a, um, there was a, one of the Incas that came back positive, so she was sent to rheumatology, uh, infectious disease was consulted, and she was uh, seen in oculoplastics. So now we're four months from her initial exam, um, her initial presentation. Uh, she's saying again that her eye pain is worsening, her visual acuity is unchanged, um, and now there's this new inferior nasal lesion that is elevated, it's severely injected, and it's, it's draining this clear serous fluid. So the plan at this time is we still don't know what's going on, so let's take her to the OR and see if we can get a biopsy, kind of explore what's going on. So this is her first surgery, um, and there's uh, down at about 7 o'clock, there's a, a, an area that is excised, and a, this foreign body material was found in, and explanted. Um, and then biopsy of the surrounding conjunctiva and tenons capsules performed, sent for PATH, gram stain, cultures, including um, acid fast bacilli. Um, the parents really looked inflammatory at that time, and so myomycin C was placed. Um, there was a large defect, so amniotic membrane was glued um, and sutured into place. And subconjunctival dexamethasone, vancomycin, and clindamycin was placed. Um, she was given some oral antibiotics and opioids on um, some topical phytomox. So the path just showed some amorphous foreign body um, from the left eye and non-specific chronic inf inflammatory changes. And all, all the special stains um, that were done on the path and all the cultures were all negative. So we're gonna go to the case number two. So this is a 33-year-old female veteran who presented to the Uvaitis Clinic 
um, after she had a three month history of central vision out of the right eye. She'd been previously seen at the VA. Um, she had floaters, light sensitivity, she said she had swirls in her central vision and headaches from eye strain. She does have a history of discoid lupus, um, a PFO that was repaired in 2010, um, an apodectomy and ovarian cysts. Uh, she's previously been on Plaquenil but is not, was not currently at the time. She had some muscular pain, some tingling in her extremities, no history of SDIs. Her examination was 2,500 in the right eye, 2020 in the left, no APD, her eye <coughs> was normal. Um, her entry segments showed a congenital cataract in both eyes. Um, there was no cell, no vitreous cell. Um, and this is her, her fundus photographs. So in the right eye, um, you can see a lot of pigmentary changes, scarring. Mm -hmm. The left eye looks normal. On autofluorescence, you can see on autofluorescence, you can see uh, some hypoautofluorescence and then some streaks of hyperautofluorescence. And again, the left eye is completely normal. Uh, and then I just mostly want to point out the OCT here. You see some areas where the ISOS junction is lost, kind of um, more out in the periphery of the, the macula. And then the phobia, you have loss of all of the retinal layers. So again, a similar workup was done um, for this young woman. Um, everything came back negative. So this time, I thought, is this you know, differential? Is this pick? Is this relentless plaque weight, infectious causes? Um, the only additional labs that were added um, were Bartonella, West Nile, and JP. So the thought was, well, let's bring her back. If everything's negative, um, this is probably inflammatory, and we'll you know, just start Osrodex. Three weeks later, she comes back. Her right eye is exactly the same, but she says that the left eye is getting new spots. Her visual acuity on the right is the, the same, but the left eye has dropped a line. Uh, and here you can see, I didn't put up the old picture to the right eye, but that left that left eye that was previously foreseen is showing these hypopigmented lesions here. Um, you can see them here on FA as well. And then we're starting to see that ISOS junction uh, loss of the, the, the outer retina. Uh, so the thought is, okay, so now there's these new lesions in the left eye, let's, um, you know, that's the eye, let's, we should, she's basically monocular this time, let's try and save that left eye, so let's put an Osrodex in, um, think about starting cell sept in a week, we won't start it today, um, so let's have her bring her back in a week. So now we're going to go back to patient number one. So just due to time, we could talk about her forever, but over the, the next three and a half years, she has expansion of the inflammatory symptoms to involve uh, various areas of her, her globe and goes into her orbit. She has 10 surgeries for exploration, debridement, further biopsies, and there's been throughout this time no conclusive data as to what's going on. Uh, it was presumed she was seen by infectious disease, um, and this is really thought to be an, an atypical mycobacterium. She would be started on IV antibiotics for 7 to 14 days. She would report improvement of her eye symptoms. She would be seen. Her inflammation would seem to be um, down. But she would have these episodes where she could not tolerate IV antibiotics. She would get nausea. Um, and she would have kind of basically this unexplained drop in her hematocrit and become very anemic. Um, so she had multiple admissions for IV antibiotics, and Zofran, um, and IV pain meds. So this is a, um, about this time, about three, three and a half years later, she, she has uh, complete ptosis of the left eyelid. Um, here you can see um, just the chronic inflammatory changes of her vulvar and helpedral conjunctiva sclera. This is an intraoperative photo. She was always, would always have the scar tissue that would have to be removed. And again, everything would just come back showing chronic inflammatory changes. Organisms were ever isolated. So this isn't when I meet her. is in August of 2015. Um, she's an inpatient at the time. Um, she has intractable eye pain, orbit pain. Um, she's needing an IV place. She often gets picks placed to get her antibiotics. And on examination, I found these small green fibers up in her fornix um, that matched the same color of her blanket that she would have in the hospital. And there was this question that was actually brought up on her, and I, I spoke to the primary team at the time about this, and it, it was the admission before this last one that the internal medicine team had been kind of, you know, helping manage her. 
had, had brought into question that, you know, is she, is she bloodletting? She, there was some blood found in, in the bathroom and she would have all of a sudden these drops in her hematocrit. Um, so she was placed on surveillance um, during her admission and there was an episode where she was found um, to tr put some lotion in her hand and turn away from the camera. Um, and the, although it was, uh, was not clear, it looked like she was putting it into her eye. So there was, uh, there was a team that approached her and her family while she was in the hospital that include Dr. Patel, the internal medicine team, psychiatry, um, and you know, basically said, you know, we're concerned that this, this may be happening um, and that you know, this is maybe the reason why you're not getting better. Um, but it was, you know, it was not very, it was not very direct. Um, it was supportive. It was not accusatory. Uh, but just to show you kind of over the time, her visual acuity went from 2030 from when I saw her to 2800. Um, and so her continued course, she she basically, even despite that that intervention, she did not want to see um, psychiatry. She did admit to depression, but did not want any intervention. Um, she had continued to have worsening symptoms, new signs of infections, um, and we really could not prove with 100% certainty that there wasn't something else going on. Um, so ultimately, she, she ended up with an enucleation. Um, she later continued to have uh, infectious signs. She had an anterior orbitalotomy, a partial exaggeration, um, and again, another admission for IV antibiotics. She was eventually seen by ENT, who did a complete exaggeration. Um, in about June of 2016 was the last time she was seen in the university system, um, and that was for her ENT follow-up. Um, I reached out to ENT to kind of find out what they, that last conversation was with her. Um, they, uh, they didn't get back to me. Um, so I did look, and it looks like she's being seen at IHC. She's had um, several admissions there for their surgeries, IV antibiotics. She was on a PCA for the lot at that one point. Um, so she's continuing to be seen in the, in the medical field. Um, so case number two, so again, let's go back to these lesions here. Um, so once these were seen, and you know, uh, the, the team, uh, Dr. Shakur and La Rochelle thought, well, maybe this is kind of like, don't you like lasers? Um, so she was seen back, um, her vision was dropped to 2400, there were more spots in the macula, so the question was raised, are there any lasers in the house? And, and they said, well, yeah. We play, we use them to play with the cats. Um, so they said they basically recommended to get rid of the lasers at this point. Um, so they decided to hold up on cell sub, which they would start Valtrex, um, oral prednisone, and again, recommendation was to get rid of those lasers. Unfortunately, she missed one of her follow ups and didn't come back for four weeks later and ended up um, having count finger vision in the left eye. Um, and her right eye is at 2600, so she's blind bilaterally now. And you can see again the complete loss of all the, um, the retinal layers here. So diagnosis in both of these cases is, is thought to be due to self-harm. Um, and um, we invited uh, Dr. Paul Carlson here to kind of help us and, and talk about some of the literature that's available. And you know, because I'm not an expert and no one in this room is really an expert on this, um, we thought that Dr. Carlson might have some some inputs. So uh, just to review some definitions, some of these have been looked at since medical school, but factitious disorder, so this is also known as Munchausen's, um, it's, it basically resolves around the desire to assume a sick role for attention, reassurance, um, some report rush of the experience, um, enjoyment of deception. Um, the average healthcare cost um, from one report um, was estimated about $200,000. Um, and this obviously does not include the psychological cost to healthcare providers. A lot of times, we, um, some providers get uh, attached and really want to help the patient, um, and are just feel, feel duped and um, can feel pretty bad afterwards. Um, malingering is the, uh, is the term for when there's intention for monetary gain, sick leave. And then I brought up, I, there's, I didn't find any you know, discussion of this, but I wondered about payments, if that would kind of go under malingering. And then there's psychogenic um, conversion disorder. Um, psychosis, and other things. So, um, so, as far as when this, when when was self harm of the eye first reported? So, there's a lot of mythological um, reports. We all know Oedipus, um, but there's also Egyptian and Nordic um, reports of 
um, basically uh, self mutilation of the eyes. Um, there are three patron saints um, and often and with vision and, and eyes, and all our three are female saints in some form throughout their eyes. Um, most of them have their vision restored later. Um, so ocular self harm in the medical literature really became a recognized phenomenon um, about world, work during World War II, and this is thought to be more to group um, with malingering. Um, and the thought at that time was that um, basically people, civilians, had no benefit of of um, banging um, or you know causing ocular harm because um, there's they're at a financial disadvantage and the hospital was not as comfortable as a home. So this time it was really thought just to kind of get out of <coughs> military military service. Um, so one there's one review of. Um, there's not a lot of information, but there's uh, one review of ocular and orbital cell phone that was done by Patton in 2004. He didn't really uh, differentiate between factitious, malingering, psychoses. Um, it was really just kind of brought up the theories behind um, ocular self harm and gave examples based on location, like corneal, uh, retinal, etc. Um, and then there's this is the, the same case report that I talked to, talked about um, 31 cases um, in, in 1947. Um, and the observations at that time were that this was more common in lower ranks. Um, the substance that was used was um, jequirity and castor oil plants. And then there was another report um, in Israel in 2013, again, of another 17 military causes um, of self-harm. So the ones um, in, this, in this review, uh, surface disease, so things that kind of uh, can clue you in are sharply delineated lesions. Um, oftentimes they um, are mistaken as repetitive infections. Um, chemicals are often used or in the surface disease with retinal um, endophthalmitis from, from needling or self-injecting, intentional sun gazing in our patient using lasers, um, orbital um, pens, pencils, toothbrushes into the orbit, trichotillomania, the eyelashes, and um, there are some reports of self medication So the, real, the, the one report that I found that was, I think, most helpful um, was a systematic review of 455 cases that was specific to factitious disorder. So I thought this was interesting. They, this uh, Yates really, really calls out um, the, the previous literature and says, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, non-evidence-based um, recommendations going through the literature, um, and really based on anecdotal evidence. Um, and there's really not good numbers, and so it's really the first um, systematic review that looked at demographics to see if there's any treatment recommendations um, and associations um, with other psychiatric disorders. So they found that 60% uh, of patients were female, which was interesting because, again, throughout the prior literature, it had been thought that they were mostly male. And again, this is just with factitious, this doesn't include malingering like the other cases of, um, in the military. The median age was 32 years. Um, and most of the case reports were not written by psychiatrists. So basically they showed that there's about 37% of cases that did have comorbid psychiatric disorders, but the thought was, well, this is probably because that's not who's writing these papers, um, the majority of them. Um, but the ones that did mention um, comorbid disease, so that 42% of them um, are associated with depression, personality disorder, which was, this was the previously thought um, main association substance abuse, anxiety, um, and, and, and suicidal ideation. So one of the things that they really were able to, you know, add the numbers up and, and, and find uh, these factors that were leading to the diagnosis of factitious disorder. And so these are kind of things that you can clue us in as uh, practitioners to factitious disorder. So the, the past healthcare service use, uh, so in our, our first lady, the fact that she had, you know, previous multiple surgeries on her arm might have been a clue Patient history can be inconsistent and unlikely, atypical presentation, um, unsubstantiated presentation. So again, all of, all of these labs can be back negative. Evidence of fabrication, so that so actually like excoriations um, on like the vulvar contractile or example would be an example of that. Um, and then patient behavior. So they, they talk about this pseudologia fantastica, where patient opposes psychiatric involvement while pursuing medical and surgical options. Um, and then investigation indicating fabrications. One of the examples they give um, is like the use of insulin, um, and like in our case, like this evidence of potential um, self-phlebotomy um, or 
risk for, for bloodletting, and then also treatment failure. Um, so other findings that they found are that about 60% of the patients elected to actually induce illness or injury compared to just 20% or uh, have each who, who would simply act out symptoms or falsely report them. Um, the occupation that was most common where it was in healthcare and laboratory, of which 57% of cases were associated with, with such, um, the most common profession being nursing. Um, and abuse of insulin and, and self venesection, which is basically the, the, the bloodletting, were commonly used and were, com uh, were causes that did lead to fatality in some of these cases. Um, and there was not enough data to really make good recommend, uh, treatment recommendations, so again, we're kind of based on anecdotal evidence at this point. Um, Thoughts. So just real quick, the, they, they did divide all these cases by subspecialties. Um, 18 op um, ophthalmology cases were included. The age and gender fit with the overall averages. Um, most of them um, were surface issues. Um, I thought it was interesting that they said they included this case of, two cases of diplopia, but there were no um, cases of functional vision loss. Um, included and, and didn't really go over like what, what was included and what wasn't for what reason, um, specifically in ophthalmology. So just some, some general um, approaches um, to, to this is that uh, patients are usually young and have a history of working in healthcare. Um, it is associated with depression and more than personality disorders, although they both are associated. Um, Successful management techniques have not been adequately studied yet. Um, in one case, but we do know that we that getting psychiatry involved is a good thing. Um, in one case, there were 75 percent of patients were confronted, but only one in six acknowledged that their illness was self-induced. It's just a very difficult disease to deal with. Um, early detection could potentially limit healthcare waste and reduce harm to patients. Um, I think that's still sort of still just not, not understood the best way to do it. Um, is the only that's the so there are my references, um, and does anyone, does anyone have any questions or comments um, about these cases or for Dr. Carlson? So yeah, I mean this is, uh, I think, often more common than we realize, and the problem is is because the patients won't admit it, one of the first things if you're ready, you've already got an issue doing it, and they, they, they won't. Uh, the, the ones that I dealt with that were even more concerning are that Munchausen by proxy child is the one being inflicted with the eye injury. The parents who already had some clear what have you. Just relate one, I think Roger Herrick, Roger, are you still here? Uh -huh. We had one of them. We were at UCLA as residents and somebody came in and tried to put his eye out with a pencil. And uh, it slipped off the bottom of the globe and lodged down the maxillary sinus. And uh, everybody was wondering what to do. The eye seemed to be, it was kind of pinned there, it was doing fine. And ENT came in and looked at it and did an x-ray and just pulled it out. It seemed to be fine, other than he had, obviously, a, a lesion in through his inferior fornix. But from the surface, I don't know, it was bruising. So they called psychiatry to come talk to this individual, and they said, well, what happened? Can you tell us about it? And they said, do you have a pencil? The psychiatrist, the resident, so I could give him a pencil, and this time he put it right through the pencil, <laughs> through the curve. And then we got back in the room. Remember that, Roger? I do. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and while it's inside, one to try to put the other eye. So these are really difficult cases to deal with. And uh, in his case, it was a, uh, you know, he had voices that was more psychotic in which he was told he had voices. So, but uh, just imagine this 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 lady is could easily kill herself and, and has uh, ended up with an exoneration over this. I mean, these are wrong psychological impulses. And when the add that to denial, and they are very, very difficult. So if I could just say, I think that's an important lesson. It's not always helpful to get psychiatry involved. In this particular case, you can imagine there was one very, very embarrassed psychiatric president. <laughs> and don't forget that you do have the resource of the patient support program. We do have it. You know, we can diagnose mental health issues. We don't prescribe, but I spent, you know, 12 years doing research on schizophrenia. I'm very familiar with psychosis, and, you know, I can help weed out these things. I know that Dr. Shakur actually um, 
consulted with me on the VA woman, and she was seeing a therapist, so didn't want to step on toes there. So we did, I think Dr. Shakur did, to consult with um, her therapist over there at the VA. But don't forget that we have this resource. We see these kind of mental health issues, and we can help out. With our patient, we were, um, there were a couple of options we wanted to either confront the patient. Uh, now she has a spouse who has four children and uh, the affect uh, of the patient was interesting because she never seemed to be very concerned about her vision loss, but was very thrilled about the attention she was getting. Right. That might be part of it. Um, so rather, I did ask her about lasers um, and I told her to get rid of the laser and she said, oh, I've just ordered a 10 pack from Amazon. <laughs> So I told her not to cancel the order, and uh, uh, but that was the extent of how much I confronted her, um, and I let the therapist go further because you know there was the risk of alienating the patient and losing her completely. The residents when you see young, mostly females, also sometimes male, lashes missing, exceptions, and sometimes you can accept as lesions or basal cells. In the 30s, early 40s, almost always it's picotillomania where they're pulling their eyelashes. And the way to diagnose it is to look at them under the microscope and you'll see tiny little stubs. Disease destroys roots or lashes and they do not grow back. Pulling your hair, fortunately for you, most of the hair will try and grow back. So it's, and then, and then of course, this is where psychiatry, uh, urbanized will be very smart in uh, avoiding school of psychiatry that uh, subscribes to this being part of a Freudian disease and that uh, is a whole literature about uh, the sexual and the Oedipus and why people do this and it gets very interesting and very naughty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've never quite known how to, how to talk to patients and parents and, Especially when they come with somebody else, it's typically a challenge for them to say, I'm sorry, but. So, what I generally do, and I'm not sure this is correct and it's not written up, is I put them on a prophylactic uh, ointment, completely innocuous ointment. And I say to them that within six weeks, you are going to get better. And then I use my most hypnotic stare. And, so <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to report that we bring them back, and then I tell my technicians outside, when we go in, behavior and cheer this patient on. This will say, oh my god, look at that. All the actors are coming back. You clever girl. Well done. And it seems to work. That was a good enforcement. I'm not sure about the psychiatric background, how we deal with this. This business about where it leads to exaggeration. I mean, this, this was a real learning experience. And all the residents and I were all sort of sadly developed. And then we found these things and we found some foreign bodies and we did go into all the details of Histopathology, we actually did find uh, new foreign bodies. That's how they find. Uh, and I thought there also, you always remember those dramatic ones. Uh, we had something called Broadmoor. I don't know how many of you know the history of Broadmoor. It's the oldest uh, mad asylum, as they call it. Uh, a woman comes into Warfield's Eye Hospital. She sits there and she says, I don't think I'm going to be able to see soon. So all of us residents work around and we find nothing wrong. Pushes a finger super immediately to a orbit for plucks the eyeball up mm -hmm. right in front of the resident who was there. And so they admit her and so on. They wake up the next morning, we all wake up the next morning, go to examine her in the middle of the night, she's plucked her other eye. Mm -hmm. And so she's, these are dramatic. This that was written out as well as, as a unique case. These are very, very difficult cases. So I know we have your disease, and I don't quite know how we diagnose. So do you, what's your, I was just curious what your anecdotal experience is in terms of, you know, like what do you feel like, what, what are your recommendations for us um, as far as getting you involved and also like any anecdotal experience and what works and what doesn't? Sure. Um, and could you go back to the, the differential slide? The differential diagnosis? Yeah. Uh, again, first of all, I would just say that uh, these are very tough cases. 
Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, no. Just in the discussion, the <coughs> right. practitioners that's it. Yeah. Uh, so th these are very difficult cases, and there's there's not a lot in the literature. I think you actually did a great job of, of reviewing the literature. There's there's not much, um, you know, um, for any type of factitious disorder. I, I think this is a good differential to consider. One thing that I would focus on more is psychosis. Um, again, there's going back to the the, the psychodynamic theories. Um, Again, I'm not going to tell you that that makes a lot of sense. There's there's some crazy stuff there, um, and the stories that you mentioned, you know, so so plucking your eye out makes a great story, you know, in history and mythology, with Oedipus, and obviously psychiatry has had some fixation with with the Oedipal story, um, and there's been association, as, as Dr. Patel mentioned, with the um, uh, uh, the eye being a symbol of something sexual, uh, yeah, that gets kind of weird. But there is, if you look at this through the, through the lens of psychosis, it makes sense. A, a lot of the common themes, you know, in, you know, when someone is psychotic, you know, are, uh, you know, things that are very, you know, very important, very, very central to being human. So, so sex, religious themes, and, and that kind of fits with, with the stories in, in mythology and in history that, that you see. But it doesn't really fit with what we see clinically, generally. So if, if someone has, um, you know, is really committed to either pulling their eye out or doing so much damage to their eye volitionally that, that they seriously damage the, the vision, um, that takes a lot of commitment. There, there are some body parts that are more important uh, in here, intrinsically to us than others, just the, the way that we're wired. And the eye is definitely one of those. And I think in, in that sense, it kind of makes sense that there's this connection between sexual organs and, and the eye. Uh, there, there's a, a concept in, in, in psychodynamic theory uh, called cathexis, uh, which I think is a more useful concept here, that uh, this is the idea that you know, different parts of the body develop, you know, psychologically, we, we develop a, a a specific attachment to them and a sense of identity with them. And, and some parts of the body matter more than others. And definitely the eye is, is one of those that we're very connected. Um, versus, like, you know, eyelashes is a different story. You know, trichotillomania, that's a you know, very different process, um, you know, or, you know, pulling hair from other parts of the body. But, you know, someone that's, that's intentionally doing damage to their, to their eye in a significant way or that, you know, if, if I was invited to urology and they were talking about a case of you know, self-castration or, or someone cutting off their penis, that's, that's really, almost always those cases, I would say, there, there's some significant psychotic process involved. And that's what I would wonder about this, these, these two cases, actually. So obviously there, there are some, uh, you know, a lot of psychological factors and, and the attention uh, that I, was there, you said with the first case, there was a I mean, consult service saw, saw the patient. Correct. Was there a question of, of any psychotic process? Uh, no, I think it was, it was just, she was just deemed that she was depressed. That was, that was the only diagnosis. I don't know if that was something they were considering, but they didn't really mention it. Do you attention seeking considered to be a psychotic process? Uh, not in and of itself. I mean, but it, it certainly could go along. I mean, you know, one doesn't exclude the other. Um, you could certainly be psychotic and also enjoy the attention. Uh, but to be that committed to doing that much damage over that much time, it, it does it does make me wonder because it's yeah because as you pointed out in one of the slides, a lot of people you know will you know when it's just for the attention, it's. It's just the subjective report that they will present, or do you know, much more superficial things. Um, but this, yeah, this is pretty. This takes a lot of commitment in a way that, you know, for, for most of us, you, you think about even touching your eye. When my kids have started to wear contacts, you know, there's all kinds of drama. You know, just just putting your finger close to your eye, there's this visceral reaction that that, that we have. It's it's very very innate. Um, and so, to, 
repeatedly do this to such an extent. That's that's pretty impressive. Also with the, with the laser. Um, so yeah, I, I would be very interested to interview these patients and, and see. But but again, obviously they're quite guarded, and you know someone can be you know um, can have psychosis, but be relatively intelligent and or very intelligent and you know, relatively high functioning. And, and able to be You're quite usually very offended to suggest that they were doing this. Themselves. Right, right, and, and that's where uh, and, and, and insist that this is this is not uh, self-induced. <coughs> I mean, several that I remember that literally took videos showing them doing this, and even then they come up with an excuse that yeah that oh hey well, you misunderstood yeah and yeah and that's where so the first few items here factitious disorder versus malingering. Ashley did a nice job of describing the, the different motivations between those. In, in psychiatry, often we'll talk about these concepts in terms of set primary gain versus secondary gain, where primary gain associated with factitious disorder is, is really for the primary gain is psychological gain. And, and that is very, very hard to challenge. People are, will be very defended against any, any other interpretation and will go to great lengths to challenge. And, and, Will, will be very, very offended and very resistant. Uh, versus uh, malingering, that would be secondary gain, and that would include pain medications, okay. as, okay. as you assume. Uh, so yeah, it's just any external factor. People don't tend to be as personally invested in this. They, they may be upset, but usually that, that passes, and they'll just go on to, but, but it doesn't have the personal quality that the primary gain situation has. So factitious disorder, that is a tough diagnosis. There's, there's, it's not a diagnosis you want to jump to because there aren't, there aren't good outcomes. The prognosis is, is quite poor. I, I think it's uh, with conversion disorder also, so another somatoform disorder where primary, this primary psychological gain is, is the main issue. But there, there tends to be a better outcome with conversion disorder uh, than with factitious disorder. In my experience, I think in the limited literature would support that as well. Um, and, and those are patients where you know they, they often do the conversion disorder patients do tend to respond uh, better to suggestion uh, to this kind of positive attitude. This this factitious disorder, I don't I don't typically see that as being as, you know as beneficial. You can you can have all the you know, be as positive as, as possible, but still, it, there's there's so much at stake psychologically for the person that, that it's 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 just it's tough. Um, yeah. In factitious disorder, would there be any benefit of uh, functionally removing the source of se uh, secondary gain? For instance, um, letting the spouse, for instance, if a, if a such as with the second case, uh, we suspect that this, uh, you know, attention, getting attention from the spouse was uh, partially responsible, and uh, making the spouse aware, for instance, that yeah. this was that m this may be happening, yeah. may remove that source of secondary gain. Would that be helpful? It, it can be, and I, I would say that's probably the the most effective approach. Generally, is so really, you know. Overt aggressive confrontation is pretty much never helpful. I think mean, you know it, it, it is helpful and appropriate to you know to, to share information and, and raise concern. But I think the, the, the chance, the best shot that you have of, of making a difference uh, in, in this person's outcome is to address the, try to address that psychological need. And and if you can you know approach it you know in a way that's says, Hey, this is where we, you know, we don't understand, and there are, there are some things that make us think that there may be some you know, you know, something is getting in your eye that's damaging, and you know, I don't know if, if you're doing something bad or what's happening here. This can be very stressful, and we'd really like to help. You know, and the stress of you know your vision, we'd like to help support you with that. Um, and if there's any way that psychology, psychiatry. And the primary team can can develop a rapport to to address the psychological needs. That's the best chance. But but again, usually you know if someone is this invested 
in, in pursuing this extreme of a, of a method, particularly in, in these cases, if, if these are just back to this disorder, the, the chances of success are pretty slim. Not that, I mean, we would definitely want to try it. I think in any of these cases, you know, if, you're, if you're suspecting this, definitely involves psychiatry. It is a fine line to walk, and you know, approaching it as even you know this chronic, chronic pain, chronic illness, whatever, chronic uh, inflammation is stressful in itself, and it would be helpful to talk about that with a counselor, a therapist, a psychiatrist, whatever, to build that r rapport, that relationship. But then you can dig a little bit deeper and get to those other issues. But without that, you know, that confrontation, you're going to drive them away and they're... Yeah. But and I think it's going to be most effective if, if the, the mental health intervention is embedded within the primary, the, the, the primary service. If, if the patient sees that as part of their, in these cases, as part of the ophthalmology team, it, obviously we're not going to lie to them, you know, we're going to tell them who we are and what we do, but, you know, if we can present that as working together, I, th I think that's more likely to be successful. Right. Which is why we have patient support program with the mental health component and the functional and the physical of the ophthalmologists all and, and then again, and then with going back to the question of psychosis in these cases. I, again, I think there's there's much more opportunity for more immediate intervention. You know, so if, if you know, in schizophrenia, uh, substance-induced uh, uh, thought disorders, uh, with uh, you know, you know uh, a psychotic mood disorder, those are things that we can treat pretty aggressively and effectively and make a difference. But I think that's not the full picture. Yeah.